Thank you again. And uh, while we are still waiting for more participants to log on and join us to this webinar, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar that with the title of New Ways of Working, Theory of Change for Community Level Child Protection Programming in Humanitarian Setting. Uh, my name is Joy. I'm the lead of the Community Level Child Protection Task Force of the Alliance, and I work for World Vision. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, let me just uh, get started and uh, give you some of the backgrounds of this webinar. The Community Level Child Protection Task Force has developed a theory of change to build a common understanding among humanitarian agencies on the approaches and core objective of community level child protection programming. We are happy to share with you this newly developed theory of change in today's webinar. And thanks for joining us. Um, I would like to also introduce the other uh, facilitators for today's session. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Joy. I'm the lead of the CCP task force. I'm joined by Rinsky uh, Ellen Maya, who is a child protection researcher at War Child Alliance. We have Elena Dinini, who is the uh, co lead of the Learning and Development Working Group, uh, who is very kind to support us in today's webinar. Um, we also have Kirsty Hayes, who is uh, the coordinator of the Child Protection AOR Myanmar. And uh, Kirsty will be sharing her experience in promoting CCP approach uh, in the field. So we, uh, we welcome you and thanks for all of your interest in uh, attending this uh, webinar. Just uh, a bit of the background of the Community Level Child Protection Task Force. We are one of the task forces of the Alliance and there is a web page uh, that provides specific information about the task force, our mission, which is to strengthen the community level child protection programming through developing guidance, capacity building resources, and also uh, to promote best practices. If you are interested to know more about our group, uh, please feel free to visit the Alliance website and maybe also to reach out uh, to myself if you are interested to join our group as a member. You will find my contact detail on the website as well. For today's agenda, uh, we started with the introduction and I will provide some of the background information of the theory of change, as well as the concept of community level child protection programming. Then I will hand it over to skills to introduce the CCP theory of change and the guiding document. Kirsty will share about her experience from the field and Elena will facilitate the Q&A session. And that will be it for the 90 minutes uh, session for today. So I would like to start with some of the uh, main key questions to engage you with some of the um, discussion and questions. If you uh, could take out your phone and scan the QR code or type the uh, uh, link www.menti.com and enter the code 1745255, you'll be able to see this uh, page of the instruction with the barcode or with the link. Once you are there, it would be good if you can send me a thumbs up so that I will uh, get a sense of the number of participants um, being able to be logged on to the website. So we have five, seven, so great. Um, I hope you will manage to log on to the menti.com as we would like to engage you and ask some of the questions related to community level child protection programming. I will probably give another 30 seconds for more participants to join. We today have 71 participants now, and uh, we have 10 people who are now on the Menti. Once you're there, please uh, kindly give me a thumbs up so that I can get a sense of the number of participants being on the, on the page. Okay. So I hope you manage uh, to log on and uh, we have now a bit more of the uh, participant being on the on the Menti website. 
So the first question I would like to ask you is, how often do you involve the community in the design and implementation of your child protection responses? This is particularly talking about child protection programming in humanitarian setting. So whether you, are en you engage them in the design and implementation all the time, most of the time, sometimes, rarely, or never. Let's see what are the frequencies that our participants engage with the community in the, the program design and implementation. Now we have the most number of uh, participants selecting most of the time, followed by all the time, and then followed by some time. So it shows that um, in the group, uh, most of you uh, engage the community in the process of designing and implementing your response program most of the time. And I guess uh, that is also the reason uh, you are joining this webinar that has a focus on community level child protection programming. As um, we will be talking a lot about how we uh, engage the community in the protection of the children in the community. Yeah, okay, that's great. I hope more people can join us uh, as we move along. Um, and then there's another question. What are the first few words that come to your mind when referring to community level approach so if you can come up with short answers uh, and you can submit multiple answers, when you hear about the word community level approach, what would be the first few words that come up to you in your mind? We have sustainability, we have ownership, transparencies, grassroots. We also have the term CBCPM, which stands for Community Based Child Protection Mechanism. We have accountability, that's great, meaningful participation. Quite a number of you mentioned about ownership, which is great. When talking about community level approach, it means ownership, participation, bottom up, empowerment, that's great, decision making. Being humble, that's very interesting, because sometimes we use, uh, we tend to use top down approach and being humble is quite critical. I want to ask uh, Petro if we also have answers and inputs in the chat, uh, as I won't be able to see it. Uh... Hi, Joy. So people have not shared uh, about the responses on the Menti in the chat, but they are just introducing themselves, which is also great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... But that's, yeah, but we do have very good um, answers and quite a lot of inputs on Menti. And uh, a lot of them are related to accountability, participation, transparencies, empowerment, bottom up. So that's great. Like this is actually the, the themes that we would like to focus on for today's um, session. And uh, some of these are, uh, um, issue of themes that are, are, are the challenge uh, or the key challenges that when we operate in humanitarian responses. So we will we'll take some time to also um, discuss and go through some of these uh, key concepts, which is great. Okay. Another one, the last one uh, uh, on my part is, uh, which of the following activities have you implemented in your programs? So there are five different types of activities. And you can select from the scale of zero, which means never, you have never done it in your program, or you can select five, which means that you always do it in your CP programs. So the first one is related to set up community-based child protection committee, followed by organized training on CP related topics and conducting awareness raising on child protection issues support the community-based child protection committee to develop action plans and to conduct context analysis with the community. So you can show um, which one that you use like very often, which you will score a five or you have never done it or rarely done it. Then you score between maybe zero to one or two. Now we have seen that uh, the most uh, 
frequent or common interventions is uh, conducting awareness raising on child protection issues, Hi, followed by organizing training. Yes. Sorry to, yes, to interrupt you. If you could uh, just close the box to the right, uh, a few participants are making right. are finding it hard to to see the the full slide uh, with the box that is to the right of the screen. I don't know if you can the one at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Joy? Yeah, the bottom, the bottom right. Bottom right. Uh, there is nothing on the bottom right. Uh, so we we cannot see the end of the different questions, like basically the right side, and there there must be a pop up or something on on top of it. Let me try to stop uh, sharing and then share it again. Uh, do you still see something that? Yes. Is Blocking yes. The view. Yes, the ones on the top are not blocking the slides, but there's just one in the bottom right that is making it difficult to see the results. You you just put the mouse on top of it now, I guess. Because mm. uh, I can't see what is blocking, so uh, that is a bit tricky. I'm sorry for the tech issue. Um, we didn't have this when we were practicing. Uh okay. Now I let me just try to try again. And uh maybe I try to stop uh the presenting mode and see if you can see it better or still you have an issue. Yeah, it seems to still be there. Um, it's something that is on the screen as part of maybe it's the chat box, like the Zoom chat or something like that. I'm not sure what it is that could be but I post, in I the post bottom. Right. Already, yeah. And there's nothing under that. I see your mouse. If you keep no. scrolling down, there, yeah, there, there uh, right there. What is that? There's nothing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm There's not sure what the issue is. Well, <clears throat> although while while it can be a little bit um, upsetting, I think we could really see, like when it was in presenters mode, like the the um, total score for each line. So maybe we can still go ahead in this format. That is what some of the participants are suggesting. Yeah, the participants are saying, don't okay. worry, they'll manage to understand. Yeah. <laughs> so don't worry too much, okay. Joy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know what is going on, but uh, let me I try to continue and I will explain what is on the on the screen. So we have uh, four points. One on the average score for community awareness raising events and 3.8 that uh, chose the training on community, um, I mean, the child protection related topics for community members. And then followed by community-based child protection committee 3.4. And the one that has less scope is the con conduct uh, deep context analysis with the community, which has a score of three. So this question uh, actually give you a sense of those common interventions that we usually use as NGO when we are working with the community. And uh, I think you are very familiar with those uh, awareness raising events or community-based child protection committee. So um, as the child protection, um, uh, community level child protection task force, we have also done uh, some revision and reflection on these common interventions as we wanted to understand whether these interventions achieve the intended uh, results and whether those um, uh, activities um, also reach to the goal that we would like to promote sustainability and ownerships. When we are reflecting on this approach with the community, uh, we realized and also raised questions about their effectiveness. So uh, as the task force, um, I would like to share with you that uh, starting in 2009, 
we have already uh, done a review on uh, the community-based child protection approach and uh, to learn about how community protect their children and to also learn about these common intervention organized and implemented by NGO. Based on the learning, uh, we review the uh, standard 17 of the um, CPMS, the Child Protection Minimum Standards, and also the task force published a reflective field guide and other learning materials to share those findings. And uh, I would like to summarize all these uh, key reflections. Uh, one is that uh, we find our child protection agencies have been using a number of common interventions for their work with community, such as those I mentioned about setting up community-based child protection, doing awareness raising events, or training the community members um, with the assumption that they do not have the knowledge um, on the protection of their children. But uh, from our review and the evidence uh, shows that those common approaches have limitations. So um, they might not achieve uh, the, the goal of sustainability. There is very little ownership as um, the common interventions are often driven by external agencies with limited recognition and understanding of the local reality. And then uh, most often we use the term community-based child protection intervention, which basically means that uh, the activities are implemented uh, within the context of community, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are initiated by the community and the community own those intervention. So we call it community-based, but it doesn't mean that there is um, a level of community ownership in those interventions. So for this reason, we are also trying to reflect on these different terminologies that we use in community level approach. Uh, the one that I just described about community based approach, which often we also uh, use this term in our programming. Uh, this basically means that we are doing work at the community level, but uh, this might not involve any uh, uh, community ownerships or community taking the lead and making decisions in the program. Uh, opposite to this is community-led approach, which basically means that community members are in the driver's seats. They take initiative, they own the process, and um, they also uh, prioritize the issues that they would like to address, rather than NGO coming to tell them what are the priorities. So we see these two different approach um, have a distinctive definition and also can achieve different results. While we would like to move away from community-based approach, we also recognize the challenges and limitations to implement community-led approach in a lot of uh, humanitarian contexts. So as the task uh, team, as the child protection, uh, uh, community level child uh, protection task force, we actually choose to uh, adopt an approach calling it uh, uh, the higher level of community ownership in child protection programming. As we uh, would like to phase out from our community based child protection approach, but we know that we're not yet there uh, to reach community led approach. So we, uh, any practitioners and agencies to consider advancing the approach to reach to a higher level, stronger ownership uh, in their child protection programming. So whenever they can promote community ownership in any of the process or in any of the activities, then it's, um, it's already uh, a, an advanced level compared to the community-based child protection approach, which tend to be top-down and one size fits all. For this reason, we uh, have developed the theory of change and to describe the way that we need to change how we work with the community. We would like to also um, promote and disseminate this common understanding across the, the key stakeholders, including the practitioners, uh, donors, and um, uh, management of the organization. So this is how the uh, theory of change looks like. There are different levels and different um, uh, uh, statements for the long-term outcome, intermediate level outcomes. 
so I'm handing it over to Rinsky to take you through the details of this theory of change. And uh, please feel free to also drop any questions or comments in the chat or Q&A box. Um, we will also uh, take the opportunity to answer any questions or comments. Thanks. Uh, over to you, Rinsky. Thank you very much, Joy. Um, um, my name is Rinske. As Joy said in the beginning, I'm a child protection researcher working at the War Child. Um, and I have been working uh, together with the Community -led Level Child Protection Task Force uh, alongside of Joy uh, in the development of this theory of change. Um, and I fully understand that the text that you're currently seeing on the slide is way too small, so you will not be able to read it. But uh, we're going to go through the, the, the theory of change in, in more detail, uh, zooming in to the different boxes. So um, don't worry. Um, as Joy said, the, the theory of change has multiple different levels. Um, I think most importantly is to understand that um, it is a part with basically outlining a pathway of, of change. So if we are implementing a community level child protection program, um, we would love to see certain changes in the community and these pathways because of, of the, 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 the approach that is implemented. And this pathway of change um, is basically outlined in this theory of change. Um, now, Let's um, go to the next slide, please. Um, the theory of change, the documents um, that can be uh, accessed through the website of the Child Protection Alliance, and I'm sure someone will be able to put a put a link um, in the chat so that you can access it if you haven't already seen it. Um, it's the document basically includes the theory of change, the visual that you've just seen, but also a guiding document, and the guiding document. Uh, is basically explaining, giving you background information um, that is helpful to know uh, when uh, when looking at the theory of change. Um, so the, the 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 guiding document um, in includes, for example, um, uh, the terms that are used and the different levels that are used in the theory of change, such as um, issues such as the target audience that you see on the screen now, which you may not be able to read uh, fully. Um, so the theory of change that's been developed may be used by, for example, technical advisors um, in, um, in the programs that you're implementing, but it can also be used by, by cluster uh, or AOR coordinators uh, when they are um, uh, working on or informing strategies uh, to engage communities in humanitarian uh, responses and humanitarian action. Uh, and the theory of change can also be, at, be used for advocacy um, purposes um, to obtain management buy-in and to provide to get funding for programs that will facilitate higher levels of community ownership. So that is basically um, part of the, the regarding documents um, that you can can read more about. Um, then please next slide. So another element that is explained um, in the guiding document is the scope of the theory of change. And I think it's important to also highlight that now, um, before we're going into a deep dive into the theory of change, um, because it's important to know that it is, um, the theory of change is developed for external agencies like ours, um, that or organizations we are working for that are implementing community level job protection programming. So it's not, designed to map a pathway of change in a community without any external involvement. Um, but it really is uh, is focusing on, on change that is put in place ideally um, when when our agencies and, and, and our teams are engaging with communities. Um, and then uh, secondly, important to know is that child protection programming, uh, prevention and response is huge. Uh, you, it, you can think of case management, um, system strengthening, uh, integration work with other sectors. Now, it's important to know that this theory of change um, really links, supposed to link with all of the theory of changes for all of those type of programs. But this one is really targeted towards community level child protection only. Um, so there are linkages, and those are very important, but this, this theory of change is not focusing all of the other areas, program areas that exist within child protection, but it really focuses on, on community level work. Um, next slide, please. So 
hopefully you have your phone still open and uh, or have access to Menti uh, to your computer and would like to ask you what impact um, would you like to see of a child protection program that achieves higher levels of community ownership so what is the impact um, if you would implement such a program um, that you would like to see please type uh, your response uh, and hopefully they will appear on the screen I didn't see any in input yet, please. Yeah, there, there we go. So bottom up changes is, uh, is an impact that's, uh, that someone, one of you would like to see through your community level child protection programming. Recognition of children's rights, very interesting. Children leading actions with child participation. Prevention and responding to child protection cases by communities themselves. Without an intervention, the community being able to respond without an intervention from an NGO or for the, from the UN. Sustainability. I see community ownership again. That also came back in earlier slides. Um, shifting mindsets. Active involvement of community members. Educational rights, very interesting. Sustainability again, stronger reform pathways. So thanks a lot. So there's a, there's a lot of very valuable and interesting input uh, on the impact level that we would like to see of uh, of programming that is that is leading to higher levels of community ownership. Now, if we are actually going to the next slide, you will be able to see the impact level that we have defined um, within a community level child protection task force. Um, as you can, you can actually read, I, I think, um, the impact level says that children in humanitarian settings are able to fully develop through improved well-being and their protection rights being fulfilled. So we're talking about well-being and we're talking about protection rights. As you can also see, there's under the impact level, there's a, there's a dotted line, which uh, is titled the line of accountability. Now, this is an interior of change framework, an important element, because um, the impact level is what we hope to contribute to and we are aiming to contribute to through our uh, community level child protection programming. Um, but contribute to, we don't hold this, ourselves accountable to this impact level. We will also most likely not measure it um, because there is so much else. Uh, in, in our child protection programming that will contribute or outside of child protection that contributes to this to this impact level. Um, so this is just more like a vision, something that we uh, ultimately want to, to be, in, be contributing to, but not um, directly hold ourselves accountable to. So under the line of accountability, you see three long-term out outcomes being formulated. One, uh, the most left one on the screen, is looking at children feeling better protected um, by their communities in humanitarian settings. Um, then the second one is children are better protected by and within their community uh, from abuse, neglect, violence, and exploitation in humanitarian settings. Now you may think that they are very similar, and they are, but the first one is really a perception of children. Are they feeling that they are better protected versus more um, incidents related, like are children actually better protected? And the third long-term outcome looks at um, community-level child protection programming and humanitarian prices are more sustainable. So those are the three long-term outcomes that are basically on top of our um, theory of change. Now, if we can move to the next slide, please. Sorry, Joy, would you mind? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, when you saw the whole overview of the theory of change on the slide at the end of the presentation of Joy, um, you saw that there were different colors used and those representing the different levels um, or the different columns that, that are included in this theory of change. Now, there is a column um, or a level of, uh, in the theory of change 
uh, indicating the change that we aim to see or hope to see um, for local job protection systems. Um, so here we are referring to, to government um, at local level, but it can also include coordination groups um, or cluster a cluster system supported by the UN or NGOs in places where um, where the government or local co uh, government system is not functional for whatever reason. Then another level is the community level, obviously a very important one if we're talking about community level job protection. Now here, the, the outcomes are formulated, the change, um, uh, indicating the change that we aim to see or hope to see at community level because of our programming. Um, so a community level includes all actors in the community um, that, uh, which includes children's participation um, as well, which is an in integral part of, of a, community, a community process. Um, and the third level is the agency level. As, as I mentioned before, this tier of change is really about a community process, community level process um, with our um, agencies uh, being involved. Um, so there we are looking at, okay, what change needs to happen at agency level to facilitate uh, these long-term outcomes um, that, that we just looked at um, and that, that focuses on local, national or international actors, um, often external to the community that are implementing community level programming. Now, next slide, please. Um, which will have another mentee question for you. Yes, thank you. Um, which is looking at the, the agency level. So not the local community level, not the, uh, the community level, but the local job protection system level, sorry, not the community level, but the agency level. And um, the question to you is which of the following, um, and you can see them on the bottom of your screen, and, and we'll read them out to you, particularly the yellow one, which, is, uh, which we can see, um, but which of the following is not part of the change statements or the outcome statements under the agency level and the theory of change? Now, the first one is reading agency puts more budgets in job, community level job protection programming. Uh, the second one is reading agency staff have competencies to engage with communities. The third one, agency has supported policies and measures in place. And the um, most right one is they are all part of the TOC under the agency level. You can see people's responses coming in um, with a vast major majority um, stating that these are all included. Um, and uh, a few people um, that are uh, mentioning that agency putting more budget into the community level programming um, is not part of this year of change. But maybe we can go to the next slide and we can actually um, zoom in to that agency level. A risky stop sharing and let Pedro to take over so that maybe uh, there's no like uh, blocking part on, on the screen. That is helpful. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Pedro. Um, hopefully um, you can now see the screen fully. Um, and again, I will read you through, I will read through what is written here. It's important to know that if you're looking at it, I see loads of enthusiastic reactions <laughs> through hearts and thumbs up. So it, it seems like you can actually see the full screen now. Um, just important to know that if you're reading a theory of change, you often read it from bottom up. Um, so the change that we see at the bottom will lead to the change that on the next level to the next level, ultimately leading to the long-term outcomes, which then um, has an impact on, uh, has an influence on the impact level. So if we're starting at the bottom of the agency level, here we're saying that agency staff 
has the competencies to engage with the community um, by active listening, respectful questioning, um, ensuring inclusivity, and jointly learn with the communities about its concerns for children. We also say that as a change at agency level, we say that agencies have the supportive environment in place, which includes reflection, training, policies, flexible timeframes, management support that allows um, teams and colleagues to facilitate uh, a move towards higher levels of community ownership in job protection programming and humanitarian um, action. Now, if that is in place, we then say that agencies institutionalize the practice uh, of facilitating high levels of community ownership. Um, and if that is in place, we then uh, say that agencies shift power towards communities um, in their um, job community, in their job protection programming. Um, you can also see that um, there are purplish boxes um, linked to the theory of change. Those are assumptions. You can see them if you're opening the, doc the theory of change documents at multiple places. Um, for example, if we look at agencies shift power towards communities in their, job, uh, in their CPHA programming, an assumption is that agencies do have the trust that community members want the best for their children. So that's an assumption that underlays this outcome, which again is further explained in, in, in the whole document that uh, you will have a link to. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Then we are looking at the community level, actually. Thank you very much. Where basically um, we at the bottom, I can't re fully read on the screen, but I have it in front of me as well, so I um, I can read it out to you. We basically at the, the the bottom, we are saying that um, it is necessary to have a trust and supportive relationship amongst community members and between communities and agencies. Um, then, if that is the case, inclusive groups of community actors, including children. Uh, meaningfully participate in and influence community decisions on child protection. If that is in place, then we say there are two outcomes. First is community actors recognize that existing strengths um, exist within communities and there are capacities and resources available in the community related to the protection of children and that community actors deeply learn from a prior variety, varied group, sorry, children, women, other marginalized groups in the community on perceived risks for children and um, existing protective mechanisms. Then if that is in place, we say community actors allocate actual capacity and resources to implement action to increase the protection of children and community actors, including the groups that we've just mentioned, um, decide on actions to, to actually put in place to address risks for children. And if that is in place, if that is happening, then we believe that community actors, including children, reach higher levels of ownership over the protection of children. Now, if we go to the next slide, then we will be able to see the local child protection system level. And here, just to explain how this slide looks like, you can see on the left the green boxes of the community level. We're basically in the tier of change saying that community actors um, recognize existing strengths and capacities available at community level, but also community actors to deeply learn um, from children, women, and other marginalized groups on the perceived risks that exist. Only if that is happening, then communities feel well positioned to work with the relevant duty bearers at humanitarian structures and, and access to protect uh, children in the communities and that they communities feel that they have and can take the space to influence policy. So basically some work and some change needs to have happened at community level in, in, in the view of the, the members of the task force prior to this um, uh, local system, child protection system level outcomes to be able to be in place. And I was looking at the purple boxes, if the, 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 the lowest two outcomes are in place, then we say that that creates an enabling environment uh, where informal community structures and the local child protection system can work together um, to increase the protection of children. So this shows that the different levels 
uh, in the theory of change, um, the local job protection system level, the agency level, and the community level, they, inter they interact. They are not siloed at all. But for the simplicity of representing that in, in one theory of change document, we have separated them out uh, through different colors and presented them next to each other. But in reality, obviously, they're very much interlinked. Now, if you can go to the next slide, please. Going back to the guiding doc documents, um, in the theory of change documents, um, as I mentioned, there are multiple um, background um, topics discussed, including principles and practices. And we are basically saying that um, these principles and practices, uh, ways of uh, working with communities through your community level job protection programming and considerations for that work are very important and that are underpinning um this tier of change and and the ab availability or ability to reach those outcomes and some of these principles and practices but the list is longer so i invite you to actually check out the documents but it's um building trust and respect uh, and relationships with communities um, prior to starting implementation um building on existing community resources strengths and capacities and processes there is a community there there are these processes there um, rather than coming in and building something new, um, start with understanding what these are and uh, and how uh, and, and make that a starting point. Um, uh, ensure integrating gender equality and social inclusion and pro um, approaches in all the actions that are implemented. Um, build community cap uh, capacities. Um, for mobilization in the community, uh, ensuring that inclusion and inclusivity is, is part of the, the, the process that is taking place. Um, and enable children to be uh, a key uh, actor in this process and uh, that have the agency to, to, uh, to be involved uh, and have their, or their voices being heard. Now, if you can go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned the, already, that uh, the siloed ways of how the, the different levels are presenting and um, the complexity of the theory of change uh, or the reality, I should say, of community level programming and working with communities doesn't come out very, very clearly or in this theory of change because we also want to allow people to actually read it. Uh, and not have arrows going all around uh, making it in a document that is that is not that's not uh, easy to understand so there are in the guiding documents also a couple of limitations mentioned and this is one of them um so it basically illustrates a simplified um process of achieving higher levels of community ownership um whereas in reality this is not a linear process uh, some changes may happen simultaneously um they may be mutually reinforcing and those realities they are for simplicity reason or simplicity of representation reason i should say are not uh, visual in this in this theory of, theory of change but it's important to know that they are there uh, in reality um community change is understood as a non-linear process um which is not becoming clear in this in this representation of the theory of change and um, and as I said, the, it cannot fully capture um, the complex dynamics, uh, systems and processes that exist and happen um, when, when working with communities um, in this field. Um, so as much as hopefully uh, it is a way to, to understand and to engage with processes of change that are happening because of community level programming, uh, always keep in mind that, uh, that reality um, is not as simple simple as um, uh, that one pager that you may look at at a, at that point. Um, I'm sure there may be very many questions, but I would love to first hand over to Chrissy, who will share her experience in the field in Myanmar, um, and then we will go into questions if they are there. Thanks so much. Hi everybody. <clears throat> My name's Chrissy, and I'm the Child Protection Area of Responsibility Coordinator in Myanmar. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. And again, and again. <laughs> so we recognize that as, since we got to Myanmar, that it's a very complex and dynamic situation. 
but we recognised that most of our partners were doing the community-based approach that, that Joy and Erinsky have talked about before. Um, and we wanted it to sort of take the shift. So we wanted our work as CPAOR, we wanted to work together for more sustainability because at the moment the humanitarian crisis in Myanmar is ongoing and it looks like it will continue to deteriorate. So we wanted it to be sustainable. We wanted to embrace respect and learning um, in Myanmar, as I'm sure in many of the places that you work, communities have their own organic methods of protecting cute children. We have over 3 million displaced populations and most by and large children are safe um, when they do this, when they're displaced. So we rec have to recognise that there are systems in place. Communities are already doing it. They have their strengths and resources and we wanted to recognise these organic um, methods. Um, and the impact for children, as we've talked about with with the um, with the theory of change, the impact for children and communities is going to be much more meaningful and have longer term impacts. And that community actors, including children, reach higher levels of community ownership, as we've talked about so far in this webinar. And we want to sort of embrace that. And we realised that we needed to be proactive, that this is not going to happen organically. If we just tell everyone, read the standard and read the theory of change, we wanted to have it a little bit more systematic within the AOR. Next slide, please. So what we did was we established a dedicated working group for community level child protection or community child protection under the child protection AOR. So we wanted a dedicated group to, to focus on um, community child protection and then make that learning available to the wider AOR so that we can take that shift towards community ownership, which is not a simple shift. And the working group meets monthly. So the role of the working group is not to just learn from each other. The role of the working group is to talk and shift their mind mindset and see how we can bring that learning to the wider AOR community and see how we can shift from that traditional pro approach with the limitations um, that Joy mentioned earlier to much more um, a community child protection program within the broader AOR, the stronger community ownership across Myanmar. We then got together and, and with the support of Joy and the team, we developed a, a tip sheet, if you like. It's, it's sort of five to six pages. We recognise that most of our AOR members are extremely busy and facing dip firefighting all the time. And we wanted something simple so that at least they can take some steps towards this community ownership that we're looking for. So we developed, I think it's five or six pages, and we're currently having it translated as well in Myanmar language. But we wanted partners to just have a quick and easy way to kind of go, okay, am I doing this? And what are the what are the skills? So respect, humility, what we've talked about earlier. So we've included all of that in the tip sheet and then tailored it a little bit more to the Myanmar setting. And you're welcome to have a look at the tip sheet and see if you can adapt it to your setting. And then we, we're focusing with the working group and now putting this theory of change, now that we have this fantastic theory of change, we wanna see how that working group can take it forward and reflect on it and how we can do some more simple things with the, with the AOR to see how we can get that understanding better known amongst agencies um, particularly, so that we have all those benefits that we saw in the Mentimeter, including um, agency commitment and budget allocation and more recognition of, of this community ownership. We've also, with again, the fantastic support of Joy last year, and then again this year, we did a webinar or yeah, more of a tra an online training for the CPAOR members on, on this process and what we can do. And it was really well received and we had um, nearly 60 participants in this most recent one that Joy facilitated. So just trying to make it, it our AOR members constantly aware of this shift. So it's, it's not, we don't just say it once and hope for the best, you know, we wanna put things in place and have it so that they're reminded regularly about this, this shift in mindset, which is not simple. And as we go into this, um, next humanitarian program cycle, we're hoping that more members will actually do this community level child protection as opposed to the community based traditional um, mo models that we were using. Now that they've had over a year of this kind of reminders and tip sheets. Um, next slide. 
we did we do face some challenges as i'm sure all of you will as you also shift in this approach there was not a common understanding of community child protection within the aor or even within the working group members they were also learning at the same time so as the working group was learning we were then trying to see how we can put that learning make it easily accessible to the much, much wider AOR. So that was one of our challenges, which we had to spend some time within the working group so we could all get at least somehow on the same page. One of the key approaches in this theory of change and in community child protection is, is this longer journey. So we're not just coming in once off and establishing a committee and then hoping for the best and maybe even giving some stipends or food and drink and facilitating meetings, it's going to take time to build that trust with communities. However, we have very severe access constraints in Myanmar and they're getting worse. So we have to recognise that we're not necessarily going to have that long-term access to the community. So how can we tailor our tip sheet to still be in line with this much longer process of building trust with communities in order to um, in order to still have that that outcome to an extent within the Myanmar context, and we may be able to go in today, we don't know if we'll be able to go in for the next three weeks. So that was another issue that we kind of tried to tackle a little bit in in the tip sheet with some examples, but then also reminding partners in the tip sheet as well that as soon as you get more regular, consistent access, go back to that longer journey. That we with it we've talked about today and um, so that also of course you'll all face this as well it's it's difficult for partners to sort of understand when they've been doing the traditional approach for so long where usually there was child protection committees just swamped all over um it's very hard to then shift that on the in the field so we just need to recognize that partners are going to take time and an example of that was with this humanitarian response plan needs and response plan we had in the indicators and the five W's, we collect two different ones. We collect community-based and then we also co um, collect community level. So we can monitor, you know, how many more partners are now moving to this approach. And we make sure our partners are aware of which is which in the guidance to the to the five W's, for example. Um, we've also heard um, Rinsky talk a lot about how we can then influence systems. In Myanmar, we, we don't have a functional um, government at all. So we're working with de facto authorities and in, in many in many of the states now we're working with um, ethnic armed groups. So we, we, we're really constrained in terms of influencing policy because the government is currently not, not really functioning. So that's another challenge that we can't reach that, that level of systems, system strengthening through the community level approach. And then of course, um, for local actors who have a much better chance of building that that relationship, having been from, from the same township or the same area. But there are lots of funding constraints for the whole AOR, but particularly for local actors because of the compliance. I won't go into it, but that's also been a challenge in, in supporting our local partners to, to get some, some funds to do this process. So the working group that I mentioned is dedicated towards recognising these challenges and seeing how we can support AOR members to overcome them going forward. Um, I think that's all for me. Next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of how you can do it in the field. So it's not just, you know, us talking at a global level, but we sort of think about how can we put this in practice with, with our partners, with all of our colleagues, so that we can start making that move and that shift. Um, so I'll now hand over to Eleanor, and I think um, there's a, been a lot of questions and answers, so I think we'll have more. So over to you, Eleanor. Thanks, Chrissy. Sorry, my camera did not start now that I wanted it to start. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Chrissy, and what like a great panel to hear um, from about like all these experiences, like on implementing community level uh, approaches and the challenges and the successes that come with it. So there were a couple of questions which were posted in the Q&A section that like I would like to go first and I would like to ask Joy to come. So the question were from 
Zion, I believe, like that's how it's read. What methods are used to gather local knowledge and understand the unique challenges faced by children in the community? And could you provide examples of successful child protection intervention that have been implemented using community-based approaches? Any context would work for me. Um, and like Zion is saying, that is currently based in Nigeria. So Joy, can you come in on these first two questions and then we'll go to the rest. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, and thank you for the questions. And um, we, we did a couple of this uh, session and usually I think um, we, we got a lot of questions asking about if we can provide answers or example. Uh, but I think one of the key uh, message we would like to get across is that uh, now we try to move away from this one size fits all approach of community based approach or any standardized uh, practices as um, all contexts are different and uh, the the spirits of community level approach or the those that we promote through the theory of change is really to look uh, into your context and uh, think about um, uh, on reflect what could work in your specific context and uh, from our learning we have defined some of the um, core components in community level approach which include shift in mindset so as the uh, practitioners and external actors we should be going into the community without assumption so we should um, uh, have the uh, let's say the humble uh, attitudes and just going into uh, the community to learn from them and try to understand their issues and uh, another key component is to con um, conduct a deep context analysis and there are different tools that are used by the different uh, actors in different contexts. So there is also no uh, standard tools that we say you must use this or the other tools. But uh, based on your context, that uh, if you can use those tools to do an ongoing and regular analysis uh, of the issues, priorities, and the interests of the community, and then you will learn from that process. What, uh, what we would like to highlight is that this is not a one of a quick process. You can understand the community from any uh, assessment, which is the usual um, kind of this that we do in different settings, that we just do one assessment and uh, try to understand all the issue, which is quite impossible uh, in, in any of the community. And then another key component is that uh, we really encourage a slow, inclusive dialogue. I think we might have lost Joy. Yes, I'm afraid we have. Um, maybe she's back on. Joy, I think we lost you for a second. Can you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened Great. to my internet. No, no worries. You were missed for only like a few seconds or so. It should be fine. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, I was just talking about a slow, inclusive dialogue. So it really comes down to the facilitation skills of our facilitator, how to facilitate that dialogue with the different uh, groups of communities, uh, including children, uh, women, elderly, and all the other marginalized groups. So I guess uh, what we're trying to focus more is on the process and the um, kind of reflective approach that we'll be using um, it, with the community. And it will look very different across uh, contexts. So again, I just come back to my message about there's no one size fits all approach that we, we can follow. It all comes down to your analysis your dialogue with the community, your reflection uh, while you're learning together with the community. Um, I don't know if Rinsky, if you have anything to add. Um... Thanks, you know, I just I was just uh, thinking uh, about everything that you've said, because I obviously um, agree. Maybe a reflection is that um, from 
I think within our own organization and conversations with other organizations is that um, next to um, under, like your programming and understanding, learning um, and facilitation skills, um, it seems to require um, sometimes a shift of understanding um, uh, of, the, of our teams implementing uh, programming, programming and uh, that, we, uh, that needs um, to get attention. Uh, because people are used to certain ways of working and um, and slowly uh, they may be asked to deviate from that um, for reasons of creating larger community uh, ownership or more community ownership in their programming um, and um, that may need to sink in, it may need attention, it may need reflection from people um, so that um, they are being able to step out of their expert role and step into a I'm listening and I'm asking questions and having a conversation with a community and I trust that um, I trust them to to uh, and their already existing systems and processes to uh, to be the be an extremely valuable basis for for a next step. So I think that a work within our own teams is, is an important component to keep in mind um, in this process. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Rinske, and thanks, Joy. There are uh, like a few other questions from Zakia, Erika, and Santiago. Um, I will just, um, as it connects well with what has been discussed so far, I will take the question from Erika, which is about sharing how to involve young children as agents in developing child uh, community level child protection task force, uh, child protection approaches. Um, so I was wondering like if Chrissy had like any experience like from, from actually involving like young children in, uh, in, uh, in her programs in Myanmar. Thanks, Elena. I mean, I don't have any direct experience. I think it's a really, really good question. I think we're, we're encouraging our partners to engage with children. And I think, sorry, my computer, my internet's also a little bit funny. Um, we encourage, and also in the tip sheet, we really encourage partners to, to work with young, with young children. And there are many phases in which we can do that. And it can also integrate with a lot of the other programming that we do. So while child-friendly spaces, for example, are not part of the community um, child protection, but it's an opportunity to sit down with children, hold focus groups in, you know, if you're a child protection specialist, proactively make the time to talk to some of these younger children would be my recommendation. I don't have any specific examples, I'm sorry to say, but just thinking about it, I think it's again, it's not just going to happen organically, but we really do need to hear the voices of children as part of that wider community. Back to you, Elena. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, I didn't mean to put the spotlight on you, but certainly <laughs> That's I, think, fine. Like, I, just... <laughs> I think it goes back like to what like has been discussed of actually like uh, speaking, listening to the community and the children being part of the community. Somebody says, what's the level of young children to be engaged? Um, Rizke, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that like that may vary a lot from context to context as well and from situation to situation I guess yeah thanks Elena that would, would be my answer as well it, it really also depends what community how communities and if communities are already used to engaging children in conversation um young children in these type of conversations and children have a voice or or barely um and it, depending on what the starting point is um yeah, it may really depend on um, uh, yeah what level uh, children are in, are engaged from the start. But the um, the reason is um, I think it's more that we keep in keep in mind why what is the reason for this inclusive approach, including the uh, including the participation of children, and that is that if anyone knows what the, the their main risks are for children, it's children themselves, and otherwise it's um, adults, um, maybe community leaders um talking about uh, or on their behalf um but the, i think everyone on this call has experience with um with having a discussion with maybe adults in the community and then if you're reflecting with children the risks or the harms that they are identifying are different 
um, and therefore it is so important to to always um, uh, as much as possible uh, ensure that their voices are um, not only heard but um, yeah heard but also taken into to account um, in any of the community work yeah absolutely and um there are a couple of more questions on a different uh, on a different type of um, of a different type of flavor and uh, quite a challenging one uh, from Santiago, if I'm, so, um, if I'm correct. Uh, project driven funding is the short term rather than long term and sustainable changes at the community. Um, so, how to deal with this? Um, you know, Joy or Rizke, if you want to come in on this uh, never ending challenge. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Elena. I'm with my uh, connection today. Uh, yeah, so we, we got this question a lot uh, during our discussion on CCP programming, uh, which is a real challenge in humanitarian context. That's uh, also the reason why when I show the diagram of between communities, higher level of community ownership and community-led approach, we choose the middle one that to promote higher level of community ownership in programming, because we know that with the short thing cycle, with donors requirement and the time pressure, Oops, I'm afraid we've lost joy. Joy, can you still hear us or this? Yeah. I can hear you now. I am so sorry. It's really crazy internet. Yeah. Uh, so I just uh, mentioned about all these uh, short funding cycles challenges. So we promote higher level of community ownership, meaning that whenever we find the opportunity, whenever we identify entry point throughout our projects, even if it is a six month project, we can try to strengthen and enhance the level of community ownership in the different aspect of the program. So we don't need to uh, really achieve full community-led approach. So it doesn't mean that you have to let uh, the community to lead every time, but in the program cycle, if you think that you can involve uh, the community in decision-making, in this planning, let's say accountability system, it's also one element that you can strengthen that um, uh, sense of ownership of the community in that aspect. So that's why we are thinking if you are really top down um, and you it's really agency driven programming. And now we will encourage you to take a step forward and try to identify those entry points to uh, make your program more uh, community like kind, kind of uh, having a higher level of community ownership so that's how we try to address those um, challenges in the humanitarian programming cycle and the short funding cycle yeah thanks uh, joy i guess that uh, will continue to be a challenge for working across humanitarian context like for community level approaches and particularly like many other activities that we do. And another challenge that correctly was flagged by another one of our participants is actually how to work on um, community level approaches within the facto authorities type of setting. Um, so in context to where we have like basically two sets of authorities, like how do we go about it? Like any, insights from our panelists here today. Um, Rinske, Joy, uh, Chrissy, I see you turned on your video. You might have some experience with that. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. Um, it is. I think it's, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, it's been one of the biggest challenges that we have in Myanmar um, because we don't, not only do we not have a functioning government, but also in many of the areas in Myanmar, it's being controlled by different um, ethnic armed groups, for example, and and they're gaining control. So, at that at that stage right now, 
we don't really have any avenues to be dealing with um, with the government and with policy. So on that level, as I mentioned in, in, in the presentation, that was a real challenge for us, but it's something that we just need to kind of live with as every context is different. And then as Myanmar moves into that recovery phase, hopefully, then we'll be ready and communities will have that understanding of how to engage at that level. You know, we'll have built that trust a little bit more by then. But it's a really good question. And as I mentioned, one of the biggest challenges we have here as well. Uh, back to you, Eleanor. Thanks, Chrissy, from sharing your experience again, like a very challenging one, like uh, to deal with risk. Uh, Joy, anything you would like to add, like in working, like in this type of context to set of authorities? Yes, Rose Cass. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Elena. I, I, I don't um, have any, I don't think any valuable advice to share. I do. Um, think that maybe the task force because there there are members from all over um, the world part of the community level job protection task force and I think it actually can be, it can actually be um, and I uh, I should uh, ask this to Joy obviously but it can actually be discussed if we can um, gather some some valuable um, case studies small lessons learned from various contexts. On um, in relation to community level job protection and in like working towards higher levels of community ownership because it isn't easy. Um, mm. It's extremely valuable, but it isn't easy, and there are so many different contexts with its challenges. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm not able to speak from experience to this one, but um, but I do think there is uh, there is an opportunity to build that. Um, yeah. Uh, like an overview of different case studies uh, and people to connect to each other to to share their experience and learn from each other yeah absolutely i think this is a recurring theme and like also in other um context like i have like been supporting what are the topics that i've been supported so there might be like some cross topic like suggestions like oh now you navigate such context that, that might be useful to draw through case studies so that's a great idea risk um there is another interesting question which is also linked to one of like the alliance like um, priorities which is around localization and uh, zakia or zakia has uh, asked like if we could explain uh, through which channels um, uh, we uh, sorry the channels through which community based actors local and refugee led organization can deliver advocacy messages regarding localization efforts and meaningful community participation and co-creation which is like again like a, another layer of complexity to make this theory of change more attainable from an operational perspective so what channels like of advocacy like would we use and are and a, is there a set of like key advocacy messages that can be used like with a variety of like uh, audiences um risky joy maybe something the task force like we need like to look into for the future yes uh thanks elena this is a good question and uh i would also like to take the opportunity to explain that uh, this theory of change is just the first step uh, of the task force intending to promote the changes in ccp programming but we recognize that we still need to do more work, including to develop uh, an advocacy brief to um, uh, really advocate support and buy in from donors, from um, other stakeholders, management of the organization. Yeah, Joy, absolutely. An advocacy brief would be like an amazing tool, I think, like to help practitioners like push like the implementation or the attainment like of the implementation of the theory of change forward. That would really be amazing. Um I yeah, think I, I realize every time I talk, I drop out off. So I fully should stop talking. But uh, oh, sorry. I sorry. Yeah, I think just uh, the last point is that we will continue to develop the advocacy brief 
so that these um, messages and the theory of change uh, is not just staying with the practitioner, but also we get support from donors, stakeholders, management. And then we will also try to look into developing the learning questions and some indicators uh, that can accompany with the fear of change and support practitioners to operationalize the tools. Yeah, so those are the, the additional points. Thanks. And I see a little art flying up. So that I think um, means a lot like in terms of how useful these tools are going to be uh, to push this agenda forward. I think I've covered and I hope like I didn't miss like any questions like or comments that were to be addressed in the chat or in the Q. Oh, sorry, let me just double check the Q&A real quickly. Um, Oh yes, there are like a couple more questions. Since we have like 10 more minutes, we can take these last two questions and then maybe like have a minute to wrap up like before we are at the 90 minutes. One question is around how can we work like with organizations that are not child-centered? So I guess it's around uh, working like on community level approaches, like with those organizations that don't have a child focus. Any uh, thoughts that you uh, are able to share on this and maybe Chrissy, I'm coming, I'm putting a bit of the spotlight on you here as you might have like some experience on this like uh, from Myanmar. <laughs> no, from Myanmar we haven't engaged with, we have, we actually right. have a couple of other sectors. So we have, for example, education sector as part of our working group. But in terms of, particularly in terms of engaging with children, we really don't encourage other sectors to do that necessarily it's got to be sort of the child protection actors but in terms of the community I mean sharing of experience is always fantastic but we're not trying to at this stage we're still in the learning process as well so at this stage we're really focusing on child protection actors um but yeah it's, it's a really good question and I think as we progress now that we've got theory of change and we move forward I think there will be much more opportunities for collaboration with other sectors and how we can integrate the learning that they have from communities, for example, and also with AAP and all of these things. I think there's a lot that we could learn to add to that that bigger package of understanding the different communities in our different contexts. Back to you. Thanks, Casey. I think that's again like maybe part of what like Risco was also saying before about gathering case studies of how we can actually uh, showcase what can be done and what is currently being done in several contexts. So that's great. One last question, like in the Q&A, is around how is, safe, how is safeguarding part of this and understanding and uh, not everyone might be at the same level on safeguarding and can, ch can child safeguarding be a starting point from, for, this, for this work, like with communities? putting the spotlight on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Elena. I, I was just um, laughing because I have very recent uh, discussions, have discussions on this because this is a very challenging um, concept in relation to a community level a child protection um, because we, we all have our global child safeguarding policies that we as staff members uh, have to adhere to. Um, and when working um, with communities, um, particularly uh, pro like working towards higher levels of community ownership, it may be counter uh, effective to actually give them our, like our people that are, we work with, maybe volunteers or um, or other actors um, to, to, to agree to and sign our policy. So it, it's very necessary to look, reflect uh, on this. Um, I think in all of our programming with, with communities, like how to best do this, keeping the goal in mind that we all want children and communities want that as well, huh? the children, their children to be safe. Um, but trying to also have discussions, I think, with our with our child safeguarding colleagues on how to best do that to not um, lose trust um, and connection with communities um, while building higher levels of community ownership. So I don't have an answer to the question. It's a very challenging uh, point, but I think, uh, again, one of the things that we can uh, continue all together learn, learn on. Um, yeah. 
yeah, difficult to interweave like with multicultural aspect, like and social norms and all of those elements like of our work. Like the intersectionality with child safeguarding is always tricky when working with communities, for sure. But again. I think we need to build like our a solid bank of like a case studies experiencing like and share that like um, wealth of like uh, you know rich experiences that are out there, and I think those were all the questions. Like I would, without like uh, incurring in other technological issues, hopefully, I would like to leave like the floor for maybe like some final remarks from Joy. And thank you all for your participation in this um, webinar throughout. Joy, are you able to come in or is your connection a bit unstable still? Yeah, I will let uh, Pedro to share the last slide uh, on the link and uh, perfect. Yeah, and then we can close. Thanks. So Pedro has like shared like uh, the slide right now with all the resources. Like I think what is going to happen is that the recording of the webinar will also be uh, received by all of you in case you were not able to listen to all of it. I think uh, through Pedro and Joy, we will try to share the slide deck so you're able to see all the parts that perhaps like when you were not able to read like due to technological issues. And I thank you the wonderful panelists like for the amazing presentations, Joy, Rinsk and Chrissy, that was like really insightful. Uh, I thank Pedro for the support like technologically and all of you for your participation till the end of like this meeting and I wish you uh, a good rest of your day. <laughs>